Well, hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's happening in the news with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you may know me for another Beatles program that I host, which is called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On the program today, we have a special guest with us on the phone, and it's Gary Van Saya. Gary played bass in the band Elephant's Memory, and um, as many of you know, the band backed up John and Yoko on a number of things, the Sometime in New York City album. Uh, They backed up Yoko on her album, Approximately Infinite Universe. They uh, made one album, Elephant's Memory did, as a band for themselves on the Apple label, which John produced, and they also played at the uh, one-to-one concert at Madison Square Garden. And Gary has a brand new CD out. It's called Pop Goes the Elephant, and we welcome Gary to Things We Said Today. Hi, Ken. Hi, Steve. Nice, Steve, you guys to have me on the show. I appreciate it. Well, you're always welcome here. You've got quite a story to tell, and uh, as for right now, you've got a really wonderful album to talk about. Um, this brand new album. I'm excited about it. I think uh, it was nice to get some of those uh, tunes out of the archives and finally get them onto a CD. Feels good. Yeah, uh, that makes me ask my first question, which was, why did it take so long to release your own solo album? Many reasons. Uh, along the way, I thought that maybe Tex Gabriel and I would do something like a co-elephants, uh, post-elephants album, and uh, that never materialized and that I had planned to do an album uh, with uh, my writing partner of 15 years, Jay Hirsch. Mm-hmm. And uh, we kind of uh, waited a little too long on that as well. And Jay got sick and now they're both gone. So it's the album in a, has many different facets, but one of the reasons that I got it together was it's kind of a, <clears throat> a way to get uh, some of their music to live on a little bit. I've got a couple of Jay's songs on there and a couple of great tracks with uh, Tex playing guitar, so it's got a lot of elements of these guys. And I could go on, and, and many people that are on the album have, are no longer with us. I've got Hugh McCracken on uh, Drunken Sailor, one of the songs on the album, mm-hmm. and who recently passed, and... James Taylor's keyboard player, Don Grolnick, he's gone. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people that uh, I grew up with playing in the studios that are on some of my music. Uh, obviously, all, they all wouldn't be around now, but uh, it kind of hit me this past year uh, doing the Beatle Fest that I, first of all, I don't have a product, and I'm seeing everybody signing their CD, you know, Mark Hudson, for one, had a wonderful CD. I, I love his record. And uh, so, you know, he he kind of got in a conversation and said, well, if you have enough stuff, you know, maybe you should think about releasing something now. What are you waiting for? So he kind of inspired me to do it, and whether he would remember it or not, we're in a quick passing conversation. And he said, why don't you just sell it on your website like I sell mine? You know, don't even worry about it. Amazon and, and iTunes and all that stuff because uh, we really just uh, kind of cater to the Beatledom crowd anyway, so it's, it seems to be working out. Hmm. Sales are brisk so far. I, I don't know whether we'll continue, but that's that's what I love about this album is the fact that it's a collection of old songs and new songs, and it's also your way right. of uh, acknowledging all the many musicians. You know, past Quite and a present. List, isn't it? Yeah, a very impressive list. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't mention Rick Morata from Double Fantasies on uh, Drunken Sailor as well. Hmm. Will Lee. I mean, it was tough for me to to uh, put another bass player on there, but he plays so great, and it was such a great track. Uh, it was actually. Uh, I'm kind of dive in here on Drunken Sailor. I don't know why I'm getting on to this one because all those people that I just mentioned are on that particular track, uh, Drunken Sailor, written by my writing partner, Jay Hirsch, uh, Rick Murata on drums, Will Lee on bass, Don Grolnick piano, and uh, it's actually the, 
this track that you're hearing was actually the original demo on the song in 1979. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jay always told me, he wrote the song for me, but we weren't getting it together, and somewhere out of the blue, Jay got an offer to uh, have someone do it on, uh, I think it was Columbia Records. I don't know whether you guys have heard of a band called Tycoon. This is way back. I've heard of them. So there is uh, actually a version that was produced by Mutt Lang, of all people, on <laughs> Drunken Sailor, and uh, it was released on Columbia, and it was a big flop. Huh. Uh, if anything, a minor, minor, minor hit. It may have gotten some play, but but Jay, my writing partner, hated it, their version. It was almost like a, a weak reggae or something. I hate to knock it, but compared to, to my track that, was the original demo? We just Jay said he he thought it would never be topped, and uh, I I still stand by that. And since he's passed away, I don't think anybody's going to do anything to change it. So there it is. I realized that it's an entity. It's something good that I have, and it should be on there. Uh, so it was one of the ones that I chose out of about I guess in my archives I had about 28 tracks to choose from. Hmm. Uh, five of which would have been really, really good live tracks, but uh, I didn't want to put five live tracks on the album, obviously, so I decided I'll just have to choose one of the five, and strangely enough, that's another written for me personally song written by Jay, my, my partner, uh, called Fancy Dan. So those are the two Jay Hirsch songs on the, the record. Were these songs that you considered to be the best of those 28, or were they songs that you just yeah, think... Yeah, this was the best of. and So it's a multifaceted reason. So that was one of the reasons, as I cited, you know, about getting more of text, the things that I had in the archives with text on it, and Jay songs that probably no one would ever do if I don't finally put them out. And uh, another one was to re-release Wind Ridge. Mm -hmm. Uh Apple didn't seem to be doing anything with it. I've looked into it through various sources for years. I thought Yoko owned the rights. So I finally, you know, contacted her lawyer, and turns out Yoko doesn't own it, and Apple owns it still. So why that's the case, I have no idea, but they're not doing anything with it. More than 25 years has passed, so... I'm just. I just said I'm going to go out there and just stick this, have it digitized, and put it on the record, because so many people at the at the festivals and all the the appearances that I do always ask about Wind Ridge because they know that John played on it, mm -hmm. and uh, it was really the only real pop song on the record. So I've been known for pop songs for uh, since way back, you know. John chose it as a single for the rec for the uh, Elephant's Memory Apple record that you alluded to, Ken, and uh, it just got overridden by the leaders of the band who wanted to stick with that political thing. Okay, Steve, Gary, that brings up an interesting que a qu a couple of questions. Number one is the version on the on your album different than the the single? Is there uh, is this a different version altogether? The Wind Ridge that you're referring to, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, it's the original record, just as you heard it on the Apple LP by Elephant's Memory. It's exactly the same mix. Ever. Oh, okay. 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 And you also have uh, a little segment of John on the Mike Douglas show talking about the band, which I thought actually was pretty interesting. I... I just, I don't know what got into me to put that on there, but I'm glad I did. It just, uh, it was just such an exciting thing, as John cited in the little verse. It's only like 24 seconds, but what it is, it's John introducing us on the Mike Douglas show. We'd only known John a matter of days at, at that point, I think. We'd had maybe two or three rehearsals, and you could just hear in his voice, I thought, how excited he was for himself to be there with us, a band and how excited he was for us. And he kind of says that to Mike in the little little clip I put on there. It's kind of cute. And then you also have a bonus track, an instrumental version of Imagine. When was that recorded? That was recorded right after John was killed, Steve. It's a, it's a really cool story. Um, out of nowhere, uh, I got a call from Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff down at Philadelphia International. 
in Philadelphia of you know of Philadelphia international fame and thousands of hit records probably by then. But they had known me through uh, by the uh, through the elephants and uh, through a producer friend of mine, Rena Sinekin, who was at that time when they called me in '81 was the an executive producer for Leon Huff and Kenny Campbell. Uh, they called me and said, "How would you guys?" Like to come down to Philly and talk about maybe doing a uh, a tribute album to John. And at first, I was a little turned off to it, but Rena kind of talked me into it, and then we limoed down. They sent her limo for us and brought us down to Philly and wined and dined us. And uh, the uh, to speed up the story, we ended up going into Sigma Sound in New York and recording an instrumental me- a version of Imagine, the five original members of Elephant's Memory. We had not been together probably at that point, hadn't even seen each other in three, four, or five years maybe. And uh, they kind of were reunited in, in the studio. That was very emotional for all of us. We were all grieving for John, and uh, it was just, it was therapeutic. It was a drag. It was, <laughs> it was a million things at once. Hmm. But the end product was Rena just did a great job of, uh, of producing us because if you ever hung around the elephants, somebody had to take control. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so she did a great job of uh, roping us in and uh, making us sound like we always did. And I'm real proud of the track that no one has ever heard this. I mean, uh, uh, Kenny and Leon had personal health problems that right after that or something and more things happened in 81 like uh, more record companies cutting back more budgets and dumping more bands and we kind of got that project kind of got st- stuck in the, a snafu with all that going on and uh, so it was never anything materialized besides this track and a few years back about 10 years ago Maybe not quite that long. Rena sent me the track one day, and I went, holy moly, <laughs> this is amazing. And uh, so it really is a good representation of what Elephant's Memory, if somebody thought, gee, I wonder what Elephant's Memory would sound like a decade later. <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> it's, it's in 1981, right after John had passed, and uh, uh, it came out really good. I'm really proud of the track, and I'm excited to have it on my record. I'm glad nobody else stuck it on theirs, or it could have it could have uh, it could have worked out a different way. Hmm. Were there other that's, songs that's, recorded at all, or was it just Imagine? Just that song. We had plans to do a couple of other songs, one of which would probably have been the most incredible version of Working Class Hero you ever heard, because to this day, uh, there's a track of Elephant's Memory doing an electric version of Working Class Hero that I've never heard on any bootleg or anywhere. I don't know. I think Bob Freeze, who used to own Butterfly Studios, where we used to rehearse down in the village on Bank Street, Hmm. might have the masters to that, but it's just a killer version of electric, uh, electric version of Working Class Hero. And I don't think that's out. I was... I tried hard to get it, and I would have put that on this record if I would have been able to get it because it was just special. And uh, of course, with text on it, you can imagine, you know. Wasn't that the version uh, that leaked out recently? There's one of John doing it. I don't it. think that's the one. No, that's not it. Uh, there, there's a much better one. I know the one you're talking about, and it's it's okay. Uh, but this would be another take. I. Do you think that one's from Butterfly, Ken? No, I thought from, it was my understanding it was from the ones one rehearsals because you told me a while ago that. Oh, okay. You, yeah, that was yeah that was just a goof. Because with the in, I think when we played it, John turned around and looked at me and says, "Take this off the list." <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't really it didn't really come out to his expectations. But huh. later on, we recorded it at Butterfly, and that, I don't think anybody has that or it's ever been out. And it's just killer. I remember it. Okay. Ken, are you referring to the, the one-to-one rehearsals? Because those have been out for for quite a while. No, there was a recording that leaked out recently, probably about half a year yeah, ago. Yeah, you're right, Ken. And, um, 
I never heard it before, and it was an electric version of Working Class Hero. I think. Yeah, you oh, can okay. find it on YouTube. Um, but this version of Imagine, uh, was it intended to be an instrumental, or, or were you guys going to lay vocals on it? It was intended to be a, a, a instrumental right from the get-go. That was our plan. We, we didn't want John. We wanted it to be John's voice missing, as if you were waiting for him to come on and sing, and it just, you know, we just, us carrying the ball, so to speak. We had, we talked for this for for hours before we even started playing and kind of worked ourselves into a frenzy. <laughs> uh, that we, you know, we talked and reminisced. There was some making up going on during the making of this song. Uh, you know, people's grievances with each other. There was internal band things going on. Many, many emotions tied up in the track. So I think it kind of comes through. I don't know. You guys can comment on that, but I, I think so. You know, it's it's close to me. I love it. Mm. No, the playing's wonderful uh, on that song, and I especially love Stan Bronstein's sax playing on it. Oh, my goodness, he's wonderful. I have to say, I haven't heard the one on YouTube. I'll have to dig that out and listen to it. I haven't. I, I'm very familiar with all the the one to one rehearsals. Those have been around for quite a while, but this new one. Right, uh, yeah, they've, I think they've even been on vinyl, right, Steve? I don't know about vinyl, but I know they've been on bootleg CDs for years and years and years and years. You know, yeah. I remember buying those, buying many of those. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But um, that's 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 really interesting. Talk about uh, uh, you did so much with this album. Uh, the first song, obviously, is dedicated to your wife. Yeah, that's what uh, first got me thinking about doing it because it was fresher. Uh, I just wrote that in uh, maybe April or so. And mm -hmm. we had an anniversary coming up June 24th, and I finished the track here at my studio at my house and. Uh, you know, and I, in the process of doing that, I kept tripping over all these other songs, you know, in and out of iTunes or whatever on, uh, you know, various things I had laying around here on, actually on half-inch uh, stuff still, analog stuff. So mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff was still on uh, half-inch masters from uh, analog, uh, I guess it would have been 24-track stuff back then. And, uh, wow. Uh, so I, I, that's another reason I think it sounds nice and warm is because there's something about when stuff starts out analog and becomes digital, it, it kind of shines through a little bit. You know, I don't like mm -hmm. the real digital stuff, you know, from the get go. It sounds a little cold to me sometimes. Right. Has there been any? Uh, when I talked to you in 2010, one of the things I asked you about was the one to one concert coming out on DVD. Has there been any more movement on that? Uh, of it coming this out. is what I know, and I don't talk to to Jack Douglas on a regular basis, but we're good good friends, and uh, and this would have been about the back around the time that uh, that the uh, Lennon NYC came out. I guess around the time we spoke last, uh, Steve, mm -hmm. was, uh, I, it was the opening, and we all went to uh, Central Park. There was like two hundred thousand people there, and they showed the movie, and it was just very exciting for Eva and I, and. And I sat beside uh, my friend Hugh McCracken, who plays on Drunken Sailor, and and uh, Jack Douglas. And Jack, you know, uh, tapped me on the shoulder, and he says, "You know, I'm kind of, I've kind of got it going with uh, with Yoko again, and I think the next project is going to be, uh, you know, redoing the one to one." And, uh, and I said, "Wow, boy, that that you you made my day." And I said, keep me posted. And uh, then I've seen him comment on you, on uh, Facebook a couple of times that she kind of moves in five-year cycles. So, gee, wouldn't that be up by now? <laughs> gee, yeah, really. Let's, let's get this thing out again. Gee whiz. I don't know what the holdup is. So, But, I, you know, Jack Douglas told me he was working on it. So I don't know what the holdup is. I really wish I could shed more light on, uh, on the show here for you. But... Uh, I, as always, you know, Apple puts me last to know anything, so I'm kind of feeling the same way from Yoko on that project, so I don't know what's going on. I, was, I told okay. Jack I would be happy to come in, and see, the, the thing with that is there were two bass players, so, I, you know, one of the, Jack and I discussed later that, you know, if you, I told him if you need me to come in and sort out what's what, because I arranged the parts for two bass players, so that's kind of confusing when you're listening back, because... 
a lot of the stuff on the first record, they didn't use the other bass player. It was just me. Uh, but stuff like I arranged to uh, come together to have a little bit of a higher octave bass part with me, and that's why it has that really big range on the bass on that original uh, live recording. And uh, But that could be topped. Can you imagine Jack Douglas going in and redoing all that stuff? You know, he told me it's... It, to him, the, the concert is so historical, it just has to be done. He's, he's no. really into it. So, but, good, but God knows how many other projects he's been sidetracked on since then or what Yoko's feelings are, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't get inside her head on that. Well, Yoko tends to do things on anniversaries or, or uh, on John's birthday, so I, I personally think that it will come out when John would have turned 75 next year. To well, me, that makes... Well, I, never, I didn't think of it that way. That makes the most sense to me. Yeah. Gary, do you stay in touch well, with Yoko? I hope Yoko? you're right. I just hope it comes yeah. out before I'm gone. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> do you keep in touch with Yoko? Do you talk to her at all? I do. I, I just said, uh, you know, actually Shannon ran into her one day. Uh, and we're talking about the world's greatest Beatle artist here, Shannon mm. McDonald. Uh, ran into her somewhere, uh, maybe it was overseas, I forget where, and they got into a discussion, and, uh, you know, I, and I told Shannon, if you ever get in that position, be sure to, to, to mention to Yoko that I have no animosity about the lawsuits of the past, or any, or anything for that matter, and she's, you know, and she said, uh, Oh no, Gary! Great, wonderful man, and you know everything was good, and that that really made me feel good when Shannon, Shannon told me that uh, because it's always your fear of the unknown. It's not like, you know, even if you didn't have bad words with someone, you you still kind of worry when you when you sued them for a hundred million. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, but apparently we're good, so I'm fine. I I wanted to contact her and and did about uh, the record. Uh, Wind Ridge, but I only got as far, as far as her lawyer on that. So, And there's never been a time when anyone has told you why the Elephant's Memory album on Apple hasn't come out, because they put out almost Isn't all... is amazing? You know, they put out the whole package at Boxer. I have a couple of theories. Do you want to hear my theories? Sure. I don't know whether we've ever discussed it on any of our other uh, shows or interviews or... But uh, two possibilities are... Uh, are you interested... Of course. <laughs> <laughs> One of the possibilities is that there's actually a, a technical problem that the masters may have burned in a fire in Fort Lee where Capitol Records lost dozens and dozens of masters. Mm. Uh, but that wouldn't, in this day and age, that doesn't hold a lot of water because you could actually take a clean master from a vinyl record, as I've done, and get you know, and re-digitize it and go through, you know, the processes today, getting it into Pro, Pro Tools and doing the whole process again, it really wouldn't be a big deterrent. But that, that was a possibility that may have stood for a while. Uh, that doesn't hold a lot of water now. Another possibility is there's a vendetta involved because let's think back to when Apple was coming to a close and a lot of this I got to thinking about when I was asked to be in the movie uh, Strange Fruit. Have you guys seen that at oh, all? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So I got to thinking about, you know, during the time that I was on in the movie that, you know, let's think back. A Apple could have some real bad feelings about Elephant's Memory because, you know, first of all, we spent a ton of dough on equipment hmm. that I had to go back to Apple and and actually go to the uh, representatives of it was John Eastman at the time. Linda Eastman's brother was handling affairs, so to speak. And I actually had to go to him, go into his office and say, listen, we never got paid for this and that. I'm not going to get into the details here, but we weren't paid for a lot of stuff. And we're going to keep the equipment because that probably will work out. I'm trying to help you here. And I'm sure that didn't go down too good with Apple. So and uh, and also the fact that we were on retainer for almost 18 months, you know, for huge money, you know, draining resources. So you know, it wouldn't be, in you know, you think, oh, gee, they wouldn't like hold it like a personal grudge or anything against the band, would they? 
Or would they? But that mm. was that was all with John's approval. Exactly. But the powers that be, I mean, even uh, the head of Apple there at the end, their business guy, Bennett, you know, even mm. had his, he had so much power that he... He actually got his own vote on which on which song would be the Elephant's Memory single, and he's the one that insisted on Madness being the single. Then you had Rick and Rick Frank and and Stan Bronstein, the leaders of Elephant's Memory, you know, campaigning for Liberation Special, being of the political mind and persuasion that they were. And then you got John and me battling for Wind Ridge, so it ended up being a three-way battle. <laughs> Uh, one by Liberation Special that I think zoomed up to like 42 and dropped the next week. You know what I mean? So much for that. You, know. you would uh, think that John well, John alone would carry a lot of weight there. No kidding. Let me see. Who do I want to pick for this? Let's have John Lennon pick the single. <laughs> Gee, does he have any track record? Oh, well, <laughs> well maybe a little bit. Or do we want Elephant's Memory guys who are in the middle of the biggest political, you know, assassinating their own career almost to a detriment because they were so into that political thing? And I was just trying to keep my head above water and just write a couple of pop songs, man, you know? I saw it as my shot, and I gave it my best shot. John loved the song. He wrote the piano lines. It was, it was, an, it was almost a religious experience for me. <laughs> It was amazing, but Pete Bennett had a uh, had a lot of a lot of say, and uh, we he didn't like that. You know, he didn't like all that struggle and nor picking up that thousand dollars a week, uh, you know, payroll for us. And uh, so anyway, so that that's all I know, and uh, that that's the way it went down. And if I offended Apple, what could I do about it now? It seems kind of petty, you know. Hmm. I did call. I did an email. May gave me. May Pan gave me uh, Steckler's uh, email. Who was the president at that time? Uh, and uh, he's retired now. And I got a hold of him and asked him what the problem was. And I never even got an answer to the email. So it's very frustrating. There, uh, there aren't any Elephant's Memory CDs at all at the moment. Any, none of the albums that are available at all. Is that correct? Oh yeah, Jerry? there's some of them out there. Yeah, there's. Oh, uh, are there? Yeah, the B- Buddha record is out there on CD for sure. That's you know Buddha reissued a lot of stuff. That's uh, it's just a single titled Elephant. Uh, they're naked on the cover. Elephant's memory. That would be uh, the record that would have had. Uh, they had a couple of minor hits on it. When I say minor hit in those days, if you got up into the '60s, you were a minor hit. They weren't mm-hmm. top forty or anything, but they had a couple records out. And that was a good period from them. And their hit when I joined the band was on Metro Media uh, called Take It to the Streets. And that's the record that Mongoose is on, their hit Mongoose. And that was a bona fide hit. I guess you could, that would be their only hit, really, if you got technical about it. And, uh, but that would be a true one-hit wonder hit because it was in the top 40. So, and that I'm not playing on that. That would be the bass player that played at Madison Square Garden with me uh, was the original Elephant's Memory bass player and played on Mongoose. Uh, that's one of the reasons we had him back. He was a great player and uh, just had left the band just maybe four or five months before John come calling. So that was, uh, I thought it was nice to have him back. Sorry, I know I'm getting off the track here, but... Oh, that's all right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so John Ward ended up being... Uh, the other bass player at Madison Square Garden with us, and a, and a great guy. Because I, I looked up, I, I just before we got started, I looked on Amazon, and I and I did see the Buddha album, but it's going for it's, it doesn't appear to be in print because it's going for like twenty dollars for a used copy. That's what happens. They fall out. You know, they do it for a while, and then they that's the way they save money. They just stop issuing them. You know. Right. Right. Oh, which is really, know, which is really a shame. Yeah, it is. Ken, uh, Gary, I do want to touch on the new album for several reasons. First of all, when I listen to this album now, it certainly sounds like because some of these recordings are from uh, the seventies, 
Um, Definitely. It um, it really Blue has. Bridge, 1972. Uh, Drunken Sailor, 79. Uh, Gonna Love You Again and Fancy Dan are 78. But but Gonna Love You Again is a new recording. No, that's old. Wow, it sounds like it was that's just it. recorded. <laughs> I know. It's so fresh and hot. Oh, my goodness. Uh huh. That's studio sound ideas in New York. That's what I meant about the analog thing. Mm -hmm. uh, man, that was just the hottest pop record I've ever recorded. And with the greatest lineup, too, because it's three members of Elephant's Memory. Stan Bronstein on saxophone, Adam Ippolito on, on the keyboards, and myself on bass and vocals. And it's three members of the band that I joined after I left Elephant's Memory, the band Everyone. And they were handled by John Padell, Alice is Cooper's manager, and we're actually with the same management company as Elephant's Memory for a short time, Lieber Krebs, who did Beatlemania and blah, blah, blah. And that's how I met them. We were hanging out at the management office and uh, I got to know them and uh, when I left Elephants uh, they came calling and asked me if I'd like to join forces with them so we did uh, four sides with them and uh, and never got a deal because it was 1978 when all the bands you know that's when the uh, all the labels were dumping bands left and right because of uh, the oil embargo and uh, putting in what became New Wave later on that year hmm. Wow. Bad timing on that. So that's where that track originates, and it's uh, one of my favorites. It seems to be getting all the attention from the radio stations. Everybody's jumping on that one as, as being uh, the, the pop song off the record, you know, among a couple others, but that's one of the ones that, uh, if I were taking a consensus right now, that seems to be getting the most comments. Yeah, it definitely, if I could pick a single, that would be the one. From the album. Well, thank you. Uh, and there you go. There's another vote. Let me mark <laughs> that down. Ken Michaels. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> See how much weight that has. <laughs> Ken, you're always you're always such a great supporter of mine. I, my goodness, we go back to I you know, way back to those call letters. I probably shouldn't say. And yeah, you uh, can. It's just I'm, been I'm a very great ride with us, hasn't it? Yeah, but you can say the call letters. I'm very proud of my time at that radio station. <laughs> It was WDHA oh, in New Jersey. But um, the, what I wanted to say about those songs, uh, most of the songs on this album has a very strong, like a late 70s, white R&B feel to it. When I listen to a song most like... definitely. That's what we were going for. Like Drunken Sailor, you I know. can actually hear Michael McDonald sing that. Like a, you know, oh, a Michael Mc... definitely. Yeah, Doobie most Brothers definitely. feel. And, and I think Jay sent him the song, you know? Oh. Uh, I don't remember what he. Where was he in '78? Was he still with the Doobie Brothers? Or? Oh yeah. But yeah. Jay knew him, and I know he sent him the song because, well, you know, let's face it, Hugh McCracken knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And Hugh McCracken was partners with my partner Jay Hirsch. They did an album together on Atlantic called Jay Hirsch and Mike Corbett with Hugh McCracken, and that's still out there. I see that all over the internet. So uh, that's where. You know, the, that's how I got connected to Hugh McCracken was through my writing partner, Jay Hirsch. Hmm. They had recorded and actually done albums together. And Huey knew everybody, so they got that song, and that's probably how it got to Tycoon eventually and got Mutt Lang to produce, you know. Right. Uh, because Huey was sending her, he loved the demo. I mean, I know your, your listeners haven't had a chance to, to probably hear it yet, but there's one of the most amazing Hugh McCracken slide solos on this record. Oh, yeah. I'm very, very proud of it. And uh, it's just amazing that it worked out that nobody else jumped on that, you know, besides Tycoon. And uh, so no one's ever done the song. And Jay, you know, always gave me his blessing. If you ever wanted to put on a record, go for it. And uh, I love your version the best. And uh, and he's right. Uh, th this, th this version that I call a demo, which is no longer a demo, it's on my record, hmm. is uh, if you would A-B the two, the Tycoon record and this one, I think you would agree that Huey's version just blows that one out of the water. Yeah. Or I can say my version, I guess. 
but there are there are certain bands that come to mind like Orleans. I would hear a band like Orleans uh, one doing. Of our favorites. Yeah, everyone was the band. Everyone was a huge Orleans fans. We loved their music, so I'm not uh, surprised that that comes through a little bit. You know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, was that the kind of music you were really into at that time? Well, I was almost in Orleans. <laughs> really? You know, they. Yeah, that's a one of my one of my pet stories that uh, talk about making bad moves in the music business. John Hall called me up one day from. Woodstock and had heard about me being, uh, you know, I had a little buzz going on in New York as a session player by being on the Pig Iron, Pig Iron album on Columbia, and I did a couple of nice things on the record, and word got around town, and I was doing a lot of jingles and stuff. To make a long story short, John Hall from Orleans called me from Woodstock and said, I've heard a lot about you. I'd like to bring you up for the weekend uh, to, do, uh, to audition for a band, a project that I have coming up. And I turned it down. Mm. Oops. Ouch. Oops. <laughs> Not good. So uh. nothing on... I mean, how do you know? You know, these people call you, you. You've never heard their music. But boy, later on, I was regretting it because I love that stuff. And I sure. appreciate the comment. If you think that sounds like Orleans, I'm perfectly good with it. Yeah. <laughs> what a great band they were, and... And what a great band everyone was. It's, you know, it's just a great track. I'm like, going to love you again, I'm talking about now. Yeah. Because I, I hear that band, I hear like a Sanford Townsend band, that kind of thing. Or um, I don't know about mm-hmm. Hall and Oates. I mean, uh, definitely when you think White Soul. <laughs> that was another yeah. big influence. Yeah. So you're, hitting it right on the, you, you're hitting it right on the head, Ken. Yeah. Average white band? That's what we were going for. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm kind of sensing it on the album, so. That's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Mission accomplished. (laughs) Steve? (laughs) Are you doing any uh, live shows, any any live appearances uh, anytime soon, Gary? The last time I was out uh, in anything notable was the festival, of course, in the end of, what was it, March, February, March there? February, I guess, 9th, uh, with Birds of Paradox, and uh, I just, and I, as I mentioned earlier, it was the first time Eva and I had ever gone to, had been invited to any of the Lapita shows, and and we had a great time. They put us up first class, and, you know, we hung out with Mark Hudson and Steve Holly, and we just had a ball. We had a great time, and uh, I would do it again. I don't know whether we'll ever be asked again, but uh, it was it was fun. Is Steve, Birds still together? Is pa- I, Birds of Paradox still together? still together uh, they're not performing right now i think jeff's off doing some other things right now i don't know whether he plans to do that again or not that's a good question you'll have to ask him yeah jeff slate does a, he was the one that put it together jeff does a lot of different projects and he assembles different bands for different things so right. you know it's right. usually the same group of people or similar musicians so you never know yeah it's like a little pool there you know but uh i don't know how he's going to top or it's a paradox, though, because that was, you know, that was a pretty unique situation. I mean, having two members of Wings and two members of the of Elephant's Memory, that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's also um, you have to realize that a lot of it's timing, because to get Lawrence Juber in the studio when he's touring oh, I know. all the time, you know, it has to be when he's in New York with Jeff. So it's all got to be coordinated. So. It's yeah. not like you can yeah, snap it was your tough fingers. Getting the coordination for the cutting room appearance that we did, I guess, you know, and it must have been hard to coordinate, every, uh, coordinate everybody. And I guess the way to pull it off is to actually have Lawrence open the show and <laughs> and us play later. That's a, that's probably the only reason it happened, right, Ken? Yeah, and actually, I got to introduce you guys <laughs> on stage. I know it was, you, and you did a tremendous job, sir. Well, that was a big thrill for me. <laughs> To introduce yeah, all? I requested you to introduce us at the Beatle Festival. I don't know when anybody ever told you that or not. But, oh, no, uh, I didn't I don't know. know why that didn't happen, but uh, you were my choice. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> just um, for the record. <laughs> let's just go back a little bit to the Sometime in New York City album. And, um, Alrighty. Did John pretty much know how he wanted the songs to go, or did he let the band really influence the arrangements of the songs? Most definitely a little of both. He had the arrangement down. He had that stone cold 
And but as far as what everybody played for their parts, we had total freedom. He really gave us a lot of latitude there. Hmm. You know, we were all studio musicians at the time, basically. You know, I mean, it was Elephant's memory, but we all had our studio things and a lot of other projects going on at the same time. You know, Stan was doing. Uh, uh, who's uh, the guy from the David Letterman show, the leader of the band there? What's his name? Paul, Paul um, Schaefer. Paul Schaefer's. Uh, Paul Schaefer, Austin yeah. Did Paul Schaefer's first album when he came to New York or did all the horn arrangements and produced a couple of things. So, you know, he had that going on. I was doing Howard Tate on Atlantic and John Hall on Atlantic, working with, uh, you know, the Paul Simon was doing this uh, songwriting class uh, at in NYU back then. I guess it must have been a slow period for him. But, uh, you know, Columbia Records called me, and I did a uh, some sessions up at uh, Columbia Records with Paul and uh, for that class, and that was really a great experience. Uh, I got to hang out with Bob Dylan up there, and Columbia was kind of like a big family back then, so it was. I kind of got in the ground floor there with the band Pig Iron being on Columbia and so got to know Paul Paul and, and Bob Dylan was would hang up there and uh, so I had Columbia and Atlantic Records kind of in my pocket there for a couple of years so it was uh, it was a great experience and Adam was doing Adam Ippolito, the keyboard player was doing the Joffrey Ballet and you know he was he was all over the place doing all kinds of records he actually plays in Cool and the Gang on the the hits of uh, the biggest hit that Cool and the Gang ever had was a celebration, and that's Adam on keyboards on that, if uh, you guys didn't know it. Mm. I know. You told me that a long time ago. Oh, did that's I tell a, you that, Ken? Yeah. That's... Yeah, I, I guess I, I, I brag about it more than Adam <laughs> does. <laughs> I just think that's so cool. That record was, oh, my God, how many records did that sell? Uh-huh. Wow. It's pretty I think amazing. Adam's got multi-platinum records for that one. And then Tex Gabriel, of course. You know, he was playing with Sam from Sam and Sam Moore of Sam and Dave, and he, we were all over the place. You know, mm-hmm. we were doing Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley, and oh my goodness, there was so many things happening during that two, three year period that it was just. Uh, when I think about it now, I don't know when we slept. Hmm, that's great how you found all that outside work while while being in Elephant's memory. But were there times exactly. with with uh, with your bass playing? Did, were there times when you had ideas and um, they either clashed with John or John suggested something that you play, or how did that work? Never said a word about anything I ever played on the bass. Loved every minute of it and told me so. And But when it came time to do the Elephant's Memory record, I like to tell the story <laughs> about the first song that I submitted to John was the song... Uh, called 42 Down the Line, even more country-ish, if you will, than Wind Ridge. Hmm. And I, I performed the song for John, and he looked at me, and I can see him right now. He's looking over those glasses, and he just looked at me, and there was silence, and he just shook his head. No. <laughs> and he just hated the song. So that's how the whole thing with him asking me to go home and write another song for the next night, that's how Wind Ridge came about. Okay. Huh. <laughs> was, there, was there a difference between working with Yoko on Sometime in New York City and with John? And also, how do you compare... Yeah, there was, because Yoko didn't... I'm sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, I, was, I, I wanted to know if there was a difference between working with Yoko on Sometime in New York City and then working with Yoko on her album. Yeah, when we did Sometime in New York City, even though it was the John and Yoko record, it was John in control. Total mm-hmm. control. Total control even when, you know, uh, our our good friend Phil Spector was supposed to be there every night, but only showed up for Woman is the Nigger of the World, and I think the first one after that was Sunday, Bloody Sunday, and then he was gone. He, he didn't like us. He wasn't having a good time. And... uh so that was the end of him for that. And uh, but on Yoko's album, John was there, and uh, and him and Roy Sakala just kind of and Jack Douglas was a big part of that one. By the way, mm-hmm. that's the first time I really worked with Jack on a heavy on, on a heavy basis was on uh, Yoko's Approximately Infinite. 
And uh, those guys would kind of sit back and and uh, let us do most of the work. We were doing the heavy lifting. We were doing a lot of the arranging, a lot of the working out. The Stan would be writing uh, three part horn lines uh, for Adam and myself to play on approximately infinite. Uh, I also play trumpet, by the way, and Adam is a trumpet player. Uh, small T instrumentalist guys. We got it together with Stan, and I think we had one other outside horn player come in, maybe on one three hour session to help out with some of the parts, maybe an alto player. But uh, the horn parts on Approximately Infinite, especially on Death of Samantha, are just, you know, the best that Stan Bronstein has ever done, hmm. in my opinion. And just, I think elephants really shine on that record. I always am the first one to come out and. Uh, and uh, really say good things about that record. I love it. We had a lot of freedom. Uh, Adam especially had a lot of uh, freedom. Uh, he really helped Yoko a lot with the arranging. Hmm. I just want to ask, ask one thing about Yoko and that album, and that is, while you were going through all this with Yoko, did you ever think that the public would accept her? And did everyone in, in Elephant's Memory really take to you know working with her and her songs? Because when I listen to Approximately Infinite Universe, more than anything else that she's done, and I like a lot of Yoko's music, the public has this perception of her, really through the fault of the media, that all that she does in her music is scream. You know, the screaming stuff that she oh, does on stage. so far from the truth, right? And if you listen yeah, to I this... I wish I could get yeah. people to actually listen to the record, but, you know, because everybody has you know, their opinion made up already because, as you said, the media just totally trashed her. Right. So I don't even think the record was given a chance, really. You know, some of the, it's some of her most sensitive work, some of the best lyrical ideas, uh, and some darn sweet singing, kind of emotional, sweet voice she can conjure up. Yeah. Uh, a total opposite of the screaming thing. So, uh, you know, I, elephants were really, we really got into it, Ken and Steve. We, we uh, we totally accepted the material, and we were bound and determined, no matter what, we're going to do the best absolute job that we can do on these tunes, regardless of what anybody thinks after it's over. This is our time. We're into it. We're given all this freedom. We've got the best recording studio in the world, the record plant. And, you know, we've got Jack Douglas and Roy Sakala. I mean, what more could you want? It's just the best situation. And John Lennon's sitting there giving input, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, it's I think, just a great situation. I think that's one that's very important about Yoko's music, that that uh, a lot of people don't accept her. And it's not, I mean, granted, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of, I wouldn't say work, but there's a little bit of, thinking that goes into, you know, seeing what she's doing. But once you see it, you know, you can't help but love it. I mean, she's made some really, really wonderful albums over the years. And, uh, you know, I mean, granted, they're, and she admits that they're not the type that you, you know, that you, you know, have romantic dinners over. Um, but they are very unique in what they what they try to do and they're and they're good and they're really good and they're great i mean you know they really are and it's too bad that you know there are still too many people i remember going to and this actually has nothing a little to do with her music but i remember my first Beatles fest when cynthia lennon was there and cynthia mentioned yoko and there were a lot of boos in the audience about her and it's just really too bad because uh, i've yeah, been to i've seen yoko live uh, on a couple of occasions, and she's, she's. An, I've seen her perform, and I've seen her. I saw her do an amazing lecture at Stanford several years ago that was absolutely mind blowing. Mm. She went through, she went through everything her, you know, her life, her art, and it was, it was just. She's really, you know, an incredible individual. And it's too bad that there are still a lot of stereotypes for whatever reason. And I'm not going to, you know. Yeah, the media uh, did a number, didn't they? Yeah. Didn't she put out some kind of a uh, another version of Death of Samantha just recently last year or something? Uh, I remember hearing. She, yeah, something. she might have. She, I think she did. She's been doing such so great on the dance charts. That that in itself is just wonderful that she's been doing that stuff and it's been it's been getting a lot of airplay. Her 
it's good been getting, for her. Yeah. Her, yeah. Chart, her chart uh, work. Yeah, that's really that's really great for her that uh, she's been accepted that way. I agree. Um, it really it really says something that that her music you know has found and John, I mean John even and I'm sure you heard John talk about her music many times where he said oh, that yeah. you know she was you know she was definitely you know on the edge and 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 it's all, taken people all these years to realize it. It's if something. anyone got her, it was John. Yeah. You know, he would he would I would remember he would be sitting at the board reading the lyrics. And he would just like put his hands on both sides of his head, and he'd just be, he'd just read it down, and he'd read it down again. He would really get involved in her lyrics before we even got to the stage of, well, let's check out the chords. And uh, he was he was very involved in everything she was doing, and he loved her lyrics. I know he did. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was going to say, yeah, I, 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 up and said something, you know, and they, they, you know, they weren't uh, above, you know, ragging on that, each other a little bit, you know. What I mean? If he mm. didn't dig it, he would have probably said something. Mm. That's it, that's interesting. I, I, one of the songs that just it knocks me over every time I hear it, and I, and uh, I know this is, you know, later uh, than than you guys is Walking on Thin Ice. That just knocks me over every time I hear it. It's just a, an amazing song. And yeah, a great, a great one. production on it too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But I always tell people and? with with approximately infinite universe for people who have never given Yoko a chance, listen to that album. I mean, there are certain ballads on there. Thank you. Like um, Winter Song, which is beautiful, and I want my love to rest tonight. Um, those songs in particular, and then there's great rockers like Move On Fast, which a lot of people have heard. Oh my goodness, Move On Fast! Have you? The sound of the band. <laughs> yeah. I mean, between the guitars and the bass, I mean, you got to credit the engineering, Jack Douglas. I mean, that, it sounds like a Aerosmith on steroids, man. It's <laughs> just amazing what he did with the guitars and bass. But you know, for people. Fast especially. For people who think Yoko's music is so weird, you listen to this album now, and it almost comes across as mainstream. <laughs> yep. But she was so he ahead, really ahead of her around, time, hasn't he? Yeah, been been she was definitely she was definitely ahead of her ahead of her time. Oh, she was definitely. You know, I mean, he and he said that, and everybody thought he was hyping her, you know, over hyping her. But it's really the truth, and that's oh. really a, really something. You're preaching to the choir. Hmm. <laughs> so the band, the band, Elephant's Memory, they really dug Yoko and her music. They really got into it. Yeah, we were really in, we really got into it totally hmm. because it was so off the wall. You you had to know the guys at that time, you know, like the song Cat Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we recorded that out in L.A. when we were at our craziest time ever. We had just been invited out to L.A., so it wasn't all done on the East Coast at the record plant. We also did some recording on the West Coast. And Catman was one of the ones done out there, and we had just played the that L.A. Coliseum, that big uh, whatever that big radio station is, and, and it was a big festival at the L.A. Coliseum. They put people on the floor of the L.A. Coliseum. It was eighty thousand people. So I'm, I met Cher that day. The Bee Gees played, and I could go on and on about the gig. But anyway, it was. When we got into the studio to do Catman, of all things, it was just such an off-the-wall song. It was just every time I think of it, all those memories of our tour out there come back and the craziness, like Keith Moon coming to the Whiskey a Go-Go and sitting in on drums and uh, oh, uh, just so many stories. And that that song particularly just capsulizes all that stuff. And uh, I love that track. Wow. Hmm. Gary, uh, if you don't mind my asking, um, apart from the music, when you just hung out with John, what did you talk about besides the music? Did you talk about politics? Did you ever discuss, did, did, you know, because you knew at that time he was so politically involved. Did you get into any kind of, you know, real, you know, intelligent conversations about something like that? Or was it mainly the music? Never. Never once did I ever have a political conversation with John. I don't know why, that, why it's could be because he sensed that I was the one that was the least involved in it, mm -hmm. that he didn't think maybe I would be comfortable. 
but on the other hand, everything was just taken for granted, you know. Uh, so you really didn't sit, sit down and talk about the things that we were all killing ourselves to to represent at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we did a lot of stuff like drink beer together <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, and just talk about mundane things. Uh, I was interested in some of the cars he had, and you know, and what his what his homes in England would like would be like. We talked about stuff like that. I would, I told him the story about when I went over there with with the uh, when I had gone over there, how I had visited some relatives and how they were be sitting around a little coal stove with a little bent cigar and you know all the and he would laugh and go, uh, you know that now you that's my life, you know. He was born on a road just like that, you know. Wow. A lot of small stuff, just life stuff, you know. Nothing real heavy. We had fun. Did he bring up the Beatles much? Not at all. Uh, it didn't really at that time. It was kind of fresh. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I would read in the, I probably told you this before, Ken, or maybe Steve in our last uh, thing, you would, you would see it in the Village Voice about how Paul and he were, you know, at each other's throats, and uh, you'd go to the session at seven o'clock at the record plant, and the session wouldn't start till eight because John and Paul were on the phone yucking it up. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so weird, you know. <laughs> and they sounded like they were a couple of brothers talking and laughing, you know. So I never really paid much attention to all that, you know. I mean, I mean, I argue with my brother too, you know, but it doesn't mean. Uh, you know, the world is over, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Hmm. Yeah, that one picture that from the, from that, uh, uh, the, from uh, Santa Monica where they're in the, all, they're all, you know, in the room together and they're, they're, or they're, they're together, sticks out in my head every time I, you know, you hear a story like uh, about how they didn't get along. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that, um, <clears throat> A lot went on that we didn't know, that we still don't know. And yeah, and they weren't. were put under a lot of pressure there at the end with all that business stuff. They, you know, they just wanted to make music, man. It was like none of them were prepared for any of that Pete uh, Bennett and all that stuff. You know, it was right. just, that was ugly at the end, man. They weren't into it. Right. I'm sure they were all relieved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not even to mention, to even to go to the place where John had to put up with all that green card stuff. I mean, that's just like another whole. That's another whole show right there, you know. Right. In fact, in fact, that at the same time, Yoko had the stuff going on with her daughter Kyoko at the same time, which oh my God, when you think of that singly, you know, that would be enough to make any woman want to, you know, not even knowing where your own daughter is. You know? Let yeah. me ask one one brief thing um, uh, about. Something to be released would be the Mike Douglas show. Um, the whole, I mean, there there are little bits and pieces on that compilation that they put out a few years ago, but the whole, the whole, I mean, I've, you've seen, and for example, Johnny Carson just put out a series of DVDs with full shows. It'd be wonderful if they could put out that whole week. Um, oh, they really would be great. Yeah. Well, they yeah. Played, well, they did for a while. Actually, they had them on yeah. VHS, and right. you can still find them. And actually, I've seen. Right, DVD. Yeah, but the one you're referring to is just, uh, you know, like what can fit on a DVD. There's not a lot there. It's like snippets of the week, you know. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, it'd be it'd be great if it'd be great if that uh, that would come out, boy. Hmm. Oh, it'd be great. Uh, I don't, again, I don't know that that would be the Mike Douglas people, whoever uh, own the rights there, right? It wouldn't be Yoko. So. Right. What was the, what was that week uh, like know. though? What was that week like? Well, we stayed at the Ben Franklin Hotel, and I don't think that place has ever been the same since. <laughs> uh, it was it was quite an intense week. We partied hardy. We had we were, tried to fit in some rehearsing in the rooms. There were a million groupies hanging around, uh, which necessarily wasn't a bad thing. But we had the wives with us, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so it was, it was tough, you know. I, one funny story about Mike Douglas show I always tell is the first day we arrived, we rented uh, limos, three limos, two black for the band and one white limo for John and Yoko. And we went in procession. We 
we drove down to Philly, and we pulled up in front of the theater <clears throat> where they recorded the show. And somehow my limo showed up first. So I remember this crowd of groupies, there must have been, I'd say about 150 strong, it was a little intimidating, rushed to the edge of the limo, and I'll never forget the look on their on their faces when they opened the door and realized John wasn't in the car. <laughs> <laughs> it was like they all moved in mass and started heading for the next living room. So it was, there was nobody in the limousine, myself, who was of any interest to anyone that came <laughs> to see the show. So eventually they made their way back to the white limo and found John and everything was as it should be from then on. That's, that's, it was that's quite cool. an introduction to, to stardom and beetled them. You know, you see that stuff in Hard Day's Night and all that stuff and, and you finally get a chance for it to happen to you and it's a big flop. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. <I> could say. <laughs> Ken? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, and this is probably an impossible question to answer, but did it ever occur to you that maybe if John wasn't constantly hounded by the FBI and, and for all the immigration problems and all, and Yoko, John and Yoko didn't have to deal with the search for Kyoko, that Elephant's Memory could have had a more permanent role in John's music? Or did you just think... You know, well, there's no be, doubt in my mind, Ken, that we would have done the tour. I mean, he was so into it. Mm -hmm. That's all he talked about. If there was one thing we did talk about every day, and that was gear and getting the tour together. Mm -hmm. That was his main thing. That was his way of kind of, if you will, blotting out all that, uh, you know, green card immigration stuff and maybe the, the stuff with Yoko. I'm sure that was rough for John, too, because he had to go through it with her. And, uh, you know, it was kind of his way was blotting all that out was be talking about what guitar are we going to use on tour for this song or, you know, what amp or, you know, let's I hear there's some new vintage amps and guitars on 48th Street. Let's go look. And yeah, and this is the kind of stuff we talked about. It was all about the tour. He didn't spend a hundred thousand dollars on gear for nothing. We were, we were definitely gearing up. I mean, we had custom road cases made. I mean. There's actually one pictured on my on my album Pop Goes the Elephant, by the way, which is available at Gary uh, at www.garyvansayak.com, by the way. If nobody's mentioned it so far, sorry. We have, thank you for mentioning. <laughs> yeah. it. What tour? What tour? What tour are we talking about, Gary? Well, that would have been the tour of uh, John Lennon and Elephant's Memory touring the world. We were gearing up for a world tour. What year was that? 1972. Had they talked? They did not talk to you, because he had been. Because Yoko has said that that they were thinking about going out in eighty or in eighty one. That never. You were never involved in that, uh, right? Well, you weren't not, no, I wasn't because it never happened. But I, I did have discussions with John like a few months before he was killed. That uh, that the you know they had done double fantasy and you know I had been calling him about actually a couple of the songs that are on my record. Uh, I, I had naked made a cassette and got it over the Dakota to him, and we were talking about uh, some of my originals, and it came up that, uh, hey, what's going on? Are you going to do a tour? And he said, we have plans, but I don't know who's going to be involved in it. I says, well, you know, if Tony's not going to do it, Tony Levin, I says, you know, count on me. You know, He said, well, you'd be the first person I called. So, of course, we know none of that ever happened. Uh, so it never really got beyond the talking stage. No, I mean they never before any of that uh, got down. Yeah. No, right, but I mean Yoko Yoko has mentioned that they were thinking about doing Beatles songs and stuff, but you didn't you didn't hear any of that discussion. No, I didn't get any. No, none of our discussions got that far to talk about any. I I never realized. I have no knowledge of any that it got that far. But if Yoko said it did, I'm I'm sure they talked about it. You know. And yeah. It was yeah. it was time. You know, you had a hit. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go for it. it. You know? But would have been crazy not to do it, but he had a lot of other things going on at the time, so I don't know. Yeah. I'd like to think he would have, if Tony hadn't have done it and it happened, I, that I would have got the call, you know. Packing order, I guess. You, know? <laughs> you always go for the guy that's on the fresh record first, and then you start looking back to who was on some of the other records you liked working with. And right. I guess my name would have been on the list. It's nice to know that he thought of you. 
Yeah, it is. Always very friendly, always very cordial, always picked up the phone. Uh, I, you know, I just can't say enough about the guy. You know, hmm. very generous. Bought us so much stuff, even besides gear. You know, uh, just a very generous guy. Both of them, actually. You know, Yoko. If I haven't said in any of the other interviews, it'd be nothing for her to send the girls flowers when she had us in the studio every night for uh, for three weeks at the record plant. She'd send the wives flowers and send limos uh, once in a while to take the girls shopping at Bloomingdale's. I mean, you know, just above and beyond stuff, you know? That's the kind of thing that they you really don't hear. didn't have to do. Yeah, right. All right, well, unfortunately, we've got to wrap things up here. But, uh, Gary, it has been great to have you here on the show. And I think um, Steve will agree with me. we got to have you back on again. <laughs> So much to talk about. Isn't oh it? God, we yes, can go. We yes, can go we, for hours. We definitely do. It's been. This you has been great. You got that great it's, input on everything. I really appreciate it. It's great to talk to both you guys anytime. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. you so much. And again, the the new album is is called Pop Goes the Elephant. And if you want to know more, just go to Gary's own website, GaryVanSyok.com. And for those that don't know how to spell your name, G A R Y V A N S C Y O C. Dot com. So, by Thank all means, you, pick Ken. it up. I really appreciate it. Okay, so thanks for joining us here, and good luck, much success with the album, and thanks Thank for being you again. on. Always yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. Call me anytime. <laughs> okay. So, for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking you for joining us, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thank you again, Gary. This was a great uh, show.